Okay, everybody, welcome to our uh, late, well, mid-May uh, edition of Micro Seminar for 2017. It's uh, if you're on the semester system, we're already into the summer. If you're on quarters, I feel sorry for you. Um, <laughs> it's my great pleasure to uh, to introduce today uh, David Needham, who will be speaking to us about microbial food web dynamics. I think he's going to cover quite a bit. I'm excited to see this. But uh, to give you a little bit of background, um, David is from uh, is from Alabama. He went to Huntington College in Montgomery, Alabama with only 800 students and uh, wound up taking science courses at Dauphin Island um, where he uh, fell in love with marine microbiology, I presume. <laughs> and uh, at that point, he uh, began... At Sorry, I got to kill the uh, parallel feed here. Um, after he, after his, his stint at Dauphin Island, he uh, he went to USC, um, which is you know a big rival of, of Berkeley. I got to put that in there. You know, I'm not a big fan of USC, but I am a big fan of his mentor, who's Jed Furman, <laughs> and uh, and Los Angeles in general. And he uh, he did a, a some some really cool work there, which I think we're going to hear about today. Currently, he's postdocing with Alex Warden at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And so, David, I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks, Cameron, and thanks uh, to all of you for tuning in and the micro seminar for inviting me um, to give this talk. So hopefully, you can see my my screen now. It, let me see. No, actually. Screen share. Okay, I assume that you can see the presentation now. And That's let me know. Okay, great. All right, so today I'm going to talk about the second and third chapters of my dissertation um, in Jed Furman's lab at USC. Um, there, I really focused on the dynamics of the full microbial food web. Um, and what you're looking at here is a um, some seawater that's been stained with cyber green. Um, and so basically you take seawater and you collect it on a 0 0.02 micron filter and use cyber green to stain the DNA of all the cells and the viruses that are there. What you, and then you use epifluorescence microscopy to visualize these um, organisms. So what you see in the middle of the screen is a diatom. And you can see that those are, we think they're charismatic and they're about 10 microns a piece. Um, and then the smaller dots, um, but not the smallest, the smaller dots are bacteria. And bacteria number in the ocean about one million per milliliter. And then, and also archaea couldn't be included in that. Um, and then the smaller specks, we consider those virus-like particles. And viruses in the ocean generally number on the order of about 10 to the seventh or 10 million per milliliter. It's been said that if you were to line up all the viruses in the ocean, end to end, they would be 10 times the diameter, no, 100 times, excuse me, the diameter of the Milky Way. So these organisms are very ab abundant in the, in the ocean, so important to study and understand how they're relating to each other and global nutrient and energy cycles. So of course, the, the Earth um, experiences seasonal variability. And half of the primary productivity in the, um, on, the, on the planet is performed in the ocean, and the other half is terrestrial. The dip, one of the differences is, though, the lifespans of the organisms that are performing this photosynthesis. In the ocean, the lifespans are on the order of a few days, whereas, of course, trees, et cetera, on land live a lot longer. So understanding the fate of these organisms in the ocean is very important. Are they eaten? Do the organisms sink when they die? Are they infected by viruses? It's a very complex food web. And here's an example of a figure um, from a couple of years ago showing the complexity of the marine ecosystem. First, you have at the base of the food web um, phytoplankton. They take up carbon dioxide, nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron from the ocean, and then and turn it into organic carbon. I'm going to set my clock here. All right. Um, 
And then the fate of that organic carbon is very important. Some of these phytoplankton are eaten by heterotrophic protists. Some of these phytoplankton are infected by viruses. And sometimes they, or, and they, they also exude organic material that is taken up by bacteria and archaea. Bacteria and archaea can then be infected by viruses or eaten by heterotrophic protists, and which ought, would uh, alter the flow of this, these car, this carbon and nutrients through the environment. These heterotrophic protists can be eaten by zooplankton, who can be eaten by fish. So the fluctuations of all this energy and nutrients are very important to understand, and we've been trying to understand this by looking at the time series in the ocean. So where we've been doing this in Jed's lab is at the San Pedro Ocean Time Series, or SPOT, where we've been monthly sampling since 1997 to the present. You can see this is off the coast of Los Angeles, um, about uh, 15 kilometers offshore and about 11 kilometers offshore of Catalina. It's at a depth of 890 meters. In the picture here, the color is chlorophyll. And this is pretty typical for SPOT most of the year, where you have, in the region, I should say where you have about two micrograms per liter of chlorophyll really close to the coast. And then at spot, you'll have about half a microgram per liter. The biomass of San Pedro Ocean Time Series looks like this. If you look at, oh, oh, oh. To do something. Um, you'll see that it fluctuates over the course of the year with highest biomass in spring and summer. And you see that about half of the biomass at spot is in the bacterial size fraction, or excuse me, is bacteria and archaea. About 10% is viruses, and then the rest is composed of photosynthetic eukaryotes, cyanobacteria, and heterotrophic protists. In Jed's lab, we mostly have been focusing on bacteria and archaea over the years. So one of the main um, points of emphasis has been on trying to understand the bacterial community and how it changes over time. And early on, well, in the first, over the first 10 years, they were able to see that bacterial community has seasonal patterns at spot. So what I'll show you here is basically, we use a, a fingerprinting approach to assess the bacteria that were present and how they changed over time. So the first point here is this, the, back, the break curtis similarity of all samples that are collected one month apart. And you see there about 50% break curtis similarity. And then when you look at all the samples that are collected two months apart, that similarity goes down a few points. And then it continues to decrease until you're six months out, where then it, they, the communities start to look more similar. So after 12 months, the communities are more similar than they are after six months. And that continues over even 10 years of data, um, where you have the lowest similarity at six months intervals and highest at 12 months. So this suggests that these bacteria are not functionally redundant, but they have niches that they prefer and seasons that they prefer. So in addition to bacteria being really abundant and having these seasonal cycles, we also have been measuring um, attributes like their growth rates. And we know that they um, are growing quite rapidly, especially in the spring. So here I'm showing the community turnover time. That is the biomass divided by the growth rate via leucine incorporation. So um, you can see that the turnover times, that is how fast the whole community is being turned over, is on the order of about five days in the surface layers um, across the year, but can be down to one or two days during April, um, the most productive times of the year. So this is one of the reasons that I wanted to look at fine scale resolution and bacteria and virus and, and eukaryotic communities, because this is the scale at which these organisms are growing and dying. So the outline of my talk today, first I'm gonna talk about um, the pronounced variation that we saw following a spring bloom. And then I'm gonna look, zoom in and look at the observations that we made regarding microdiversity of the organisms that were present during that phytoplankton bloom and its decay. So the way that we assess these microbial communities is by serial fractionation of seawater for DNA extraction. Um, the first thing we do is remove the large organisms, metazoans like copepods with 80 micron mesh. 
Then we collect the larger organisms, uh, large organisms like phytoplankton, particle attached bacteria and archaea or large bacteria on a one micron AE glass filter. And then we collect the bacteria, archaea, infected bacteria in archaea and, and smaller eukaryotes on a 0 0.02 filter. And then we collect that filtrate on a 0 0.02 filter and we collect viruses on this 0 0.02 filter. So phytoplankton blooms are common over the 10 years and they mostly occur in March and April. So here's a um, MODIS satellite imagery of, or uh, composite of eight um, day averages over the, from 2002 to 2014. And you can see that in general, chlorophyll is low, probably less than a microgram per liter. But there's, there's these really sharp spikes where chlorophyll increases really rapidly, probably over just a few days. And th so these are really important to export and understanding flows of carbon in the environment. But unfortunately, because they're so ephemeral, we hadn't actually measured, been able to measure any of these when we went out to sample with our monthly sampling. But as it turned out, one of the daily samplings that we performed occurred on one of the largest phytoplankton blooms that we had seen at SPOT over the almost 20 years of study. So here's the environmental context of that phytoplankton bloom. We really looked at the decay of that phytoplankton bloom. We think we got out there towards the end of it. But you can get a, the black line and the black dots are temperature over time. And so the black line is from a nearby buoy and you can see temperature going up and the open circles are temperatures that we actually measured. So you can get a sense of the, uh, how often we sampled, which was about daily during March, weekly in April, for daily for a couple of weeks in May and then weekly roughly until August. And in the background here, the, the gray is chlorophyll. You can see that we sent the highest we ever saw it was the first day that we sampled. It goes down quite rapidly. There's a second peak here also in March. And we don't know what caused this um, bloom. We suspect that it had something to do with temperature um, of the water warming, the days becoming longer, perhaps something to do with this wind that perhaps brought nutrients to the surface. Um, but um, whatever it was, it was quite a large bloom. So the way that we assess the microbial community with this bloom was by rRNA gene sequencing um, using uh, V4, V5 primers that amplify bacteria, archaea, phytoplankton, chloroplast, and eukaryotes, all with one primer set. And you can see our assessment of these primers in Parada et al. and environmental microbiology. If uh, 2016. Um, these, uh, for the first part of the talk, I'm going to the data that I'm going to show you is from 99% sequence similarity clusters and 2x250 two and 2x300 two mice se sequencing. Um, we assessed the accuracy and precision of these pr this primer set with a custom made mock community that I made from spot clones. Now we have about four different mock communities, but in general, there's two types. We made an even community that roughly had um, about 10 taxa at 10% each, and we had a staggered community that was supposed to approximate an average community at spot that had 27 taxa from 0.1% to 33%. And we've been, people have been asking for these, and we're able to provide a small amount if you just contact myself or if you contact um, uh, Jed Furman. So when we mix these, um, we, I'll show you the data from the staggered community. What we saw we, with this, um, so on the x-axis here is the input abundance of the clones of known concentrations that we added. And then on the y-axis is the observed relative abundance of using these primers. So basically we did, we pulled the, the clones, we amplified them with the primers, we sequenced them just like all in parallel with other samples and then process them also in parallel with other samples, and the results are here. As you can see, um, there's pretty high correspondence between the expected and the observed values of 0.97 R squared. So a couple of notes on the taxonomy that I used throughout the talk. Um, I classified the chloroplasts, um, and I should note that 
We do not amplify dinoflagellate chloroplasts. Apparently, dinoflagellate chloroplasts are very odd and are not amplified with these, this primer set. Um, but we classified them with FIDOREF and NCBI database, and we classified the bacteria and archaea with Silva and green genes and NCBI. And I think that everyone should be using multiple databases to classify their um, organisms because often they're not, they're, the data sets are updated um, at different times. I like NCBI to just see what's the cutting edge of what's the closest thing matched to a certain OTU. All right, so when I first got the data back, we saw that about 40% of the sequences on the one micron size fraction were chloroplasts. So I said, okay, we better, we better look at this. And we were really surprised to see the really fast dynamics that we saw over the first 18 days. So here's that the chlorophyll in the back is the gray again. And you can see that um, pseudonychia, which is a diatom, made up 60% of the chloroplast sequences on the first sampling day. This wasn't a big surprise because a few days before we had gone out, um, Dave Karen's lab at USC had measured the highest demoic acid concentrations they had ever seen at spot just a few days before we went out. So we thought it was a diatom bloom, pseudonychia bloom. So this was not a surprise. What we were somewhat surprised to, or were surprised to see was that there are two other taxa of pseudonychia that became dominant um, over the first four days of sampling. So what I'm showing here is any taxa that became most abundant over this first 17 or 18 days or so. Um, so within the first days, there were three different strains of pseudonychia that became dominant. This tetrastomus, which is usually a coastal organism, um, and this heterosigma was refitophyte, and catosterus is another diatom. Um, and then you saw a shift to smaller organisms like Austriacoccus, Phaeocystis, Amentonia, and Chrysochromulina. Now, this sort of dynamic where you go from a diatom bloom to these smaller phytoplankton like Austriacoccus has been thought to be classic, is what we thought happened as nutrients run out. These organisms that are more attuned to low nutrients will do better later. But I think we sort of thought that this would happen over a couple of weeks or, 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 or several weeks to a couple of months. But what we saw was it was happening on a really short time scale, especially with this rapid dynamics in the first six days. And it's important to note that these taxa probably vary in their sinking rates, their growth requirements, the carbohydrates, for example, that they may be exuding. Um, their grazing susceptibilities, their different sizes, they of course have different viruses, and also uh, they may have uh, different toxin productions. So it was really su surprised us and made us think about how these phytoplankton blooms are studied, um, whether or not this is spatial variation or temporal variation, what I'll get more into. We need to think about, wow, these are not homogenous, and there's actually quite a bit of um, variability within a phytoplankton bloom. So here's a more comprehensive view of the phytoplankton. Um, and you'll see that um, this is over until August, from March until August now. And on the left side is a phylogenetic tree. So you have these Micromonas austriacoccus, organisms that are quite small. You see they were quite low early on during the largest part of the bloom. And then they were really common after that. Um, you'll see that some, a couple of these diatoms that were really uh, pseudonychia diatoms that were abundant at the beginning of the bloom aren't really detected for the rest of the time series. Likewise, the tetracelmus um, was only detected a few times here. Um, but you see some of these other phytoplankton are, were much more common for the rest of the time series. So really, um, this analysis of chloroplast sequences, it's been done, but not very much. Um, so we wanted to see how it um, compared to the more typical measurements um, of phytoplankton by sequencing, which is with 18S. So here I can look at that 18S that we amplify with the same primer set. And here is the 18S tree of the dominant uh, above like point, uh, uh, maybe 1%. They were, a 0.1% are up on average. I show it here. And then I pulled out the organisms from the chloroplast sequences that were best correlated to each of these organisms that had a similar name. So in theory, we're looking at the same organism. 
its 18S and its chloroplast and how that varied over time. For the most part, there were always a comparable 18S and chloroplast OTU. So take, for example, this Ariococcus. Here in the middle, you see the Spearman's correlations over time between these two data sets. There was a 0.9 correlation between this Ariococcus. Um, you'll see the diatoms were both in the chloroplast and 18S really dominant begin at the beginning, as I've already shown you. Um, others, these um, Mammalaceae, Austriococcus, Bathycoccus, Macromonas, see these Spearman's correlation values are very high, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So both of these um, assays are giving us very quite similar answers now. And this is despite the fact that um, copy number varies widely, um, especially in 18S. And so we can get a sense of which organisms are possibly um, uh, being over or underestimated by 18S versus chloroplast. For example, this Guinardia, you can see that there was a 0.8 Spearman's correlation, but it was a lot higher in 18S. So this may be an organism that has 100 or 1,000 18S copies and a lower number of chloroplasts per cell. Um, there was another one I wanted to show. Um, uh, Cuscana discus, I think. Where is it? Uh, here, you can see that there was a 0.9 correlation between the two, but the overall abundance of the Cuscana discus in the 18S, which is a really large diatom, was much higher. So possibly copy number bias here in 18S. All right. So that was the phytoplankton and the bacterial response, or, or how did the bacteria and archaea respond to this phytoplankton bloom? So here's the data over the short window um, of March. Um, and with chlorophyll again in the background, you can see the verrucal microbia. This is the larger particle attached, so the one micron filter. was The verrucal microbia was up to 20 or 30 percent early on in the bloom. And then there were three flavobacteria. These are three flavobacteria that had a really quick succession uh, during the early part of the phytoplankton bloom. And then we were really surprised to see the marine group 2 archaea um, that bloomed up to 30% over just a few days in March. Um, now, it should be noted that this is not the marine group 1 archaea, which is a crin archaea, which are ammonium oxidizing archaea. These are mostly heterotrophic organisms, the marine group 2 archaea, and possibly taking up lipids and proteins from the environment. And then you see SAR-11, which is the most abundant organism in the ocean generally, um, became more dominant later in this bloom. And then another flavor bacteria. So we don't know the nature of uh, the interactions that these organisms are having with phytoplankton. Um, it's, it's like, for example, the verrucal microbia. It may be living a particle attached. It may just be a large organism. It may have a very specific interaction with um, phytoplankton, we don't know yet. It's interesting to think about, it may not just be utilizing organic carbon from phytoplankton, but it also may be supplying substrates to the phytoplankton. For example, it's known that vertical microbia can produce vitamins, whereas phytoplankton need vitamins to survive. And so there may be some sort of positive interaction between these two organisms. This flavobacteria response, um, it's not surprised to see flavobacteria respond in general. There was a paper um, in, in science of 2009 showing a succession of flavobacteria over the course of weeks to a month in response to a phytoplankton bloom. And we certainly see that, which I'll show you in a second, but we also see this really fast dynamic um, early on. And then, of course, the marine group archaea. And so is this some sort of, in that, in that science paper, they suggested that um, the flavobacteria are, have this succession, and through the transcriptomes that they did, you could actually see that perhaps they were utilizing different substrates. As different substrates were broken down and others became available, these flavobacteria were succeeding in that way. So that may be happening on an even shorter time scale, as we're seeing here. Um, in general, the small and free living size fraction was less dynamic. Star 11 uh, tended to dominate. Um, you see another uh, one of the another flavobacteria here, and then SAR92, which is a gamma proteobacteria. It's heterotrophic. You can see was quite abundant, up to 12% or so in the small and free living size fraction, but only over about 10 days in March. Now, one thing that we thought was interesting: there's some evidence, excuse me, 
that suggests that the marine group two archaea are living particle or associated with particles, but our data doesn't uh, it also suggest that they're free living. So they were equal abundance of the marine group two archaea in both the small and particle attached or large size fraction. All right, so here's the more comprehensive view of the bacteria in archaea. And on the left here is the one micron size fraction. And on the right is the 0.2 size fraction. You can see after March, the cyanobacteria here um, tended to dominate in the one micron size fraction with prochlorococcus coming up just at the end. Um, and you see that SAR11 tended to dominate in the, oh, in the um, 0.2 size fraction. I want to point out the wide diversity that we saw in flavobacteria. And you see in general, the ones that occurred early in the bloom are different than the ones that occurred during April and May. So we definitely see that um, uh, weekly to monthly um, successional pattern of flavobacteria, but we, but it's just, and we, but we just also see that really fast dynamic in March. All right, so we wanted to see what are these biological communities correlated to? Are they correlated to one another more than the environmental parameters? So what I did was a Mantel test, which is comparing the similarity matrices of communities to environmental parameters. Basically, are the communities changing together? When there's a big shift in one community, is there a corresponding shift to another community? And does that all, and how do the nutrient, the nutrients do the same thing? Does temperature do the same thing? So I put this as a network figure. So each community is represented by one of the symbols. So it's like, for example, you can see a very high correlation between the phytoplankton, the 16S chloroplast, and the 18S of phytoplankton, 0.9. See a very high correlation between the, the large and free living uh, size fractions of the prokaryotes um, or bacteria and archaea. Um, you see, a 0.5 correlation between phytoplankton and chlorophyll and between phytoplankton and combine all um, environmental parameters. You see that in general, the environmental parameters are highly correlated, but nothing greater than 0.5 on the Mantel test to the prokaryotic size fraction, but they were 0.7 to the phytoplankton. So this suggests that there's very strong interactions between the microbial communities. We know that um, the environmental parameters, nutrients are necessary to set the bloom on its course, to, to cause the bloom. But then we think after that occurs, perhaps these microbial interactions uh, dictate um, who the dynamics of the organisms in general, or their envir important environmental parameters or substrates that we're not able to measure with these simple inorganic nutrients that we measured like phosphorus, nitrite, nitrate, and silicate. Okay, so when we submitted this, we knew it was gonna be important to talk about, is this variation that we saw spatial or is it temporal, temporal variation? Well, we suggested um, in the original submission that it was both, and we think it is both, of course. The, we know that the ocean is not a bathtub and there's a lot of advection and mixing and diffusion in the ocean. But one of the wires reviewers said, well, you know, you can really test this if you look at, um, how fast these communities are changing. We know something about the growth rates of phytoplankton. They generally double at fastest uh, day, uh, at once or at twice per day. So the reviewer said, um, take a look and see if these look reasonable for temporal variation. And so that's what I did here. Um, you can see the apparent net growth rate of all the changes from day to day in the phytoplankton and the relative frequency at which they occurred. So um, 65 percent or so of the changes that we saw from day to day would only have taken one doubling of phytoplankton. Another 20 percent or so uh, or so could have been explained by two doublings of phytoplankton. So that's upwards of 85 percent of the day-to-day -day change could be could be reasonably explained um, by growth alone. Um, and then another 15 percent are too fast possibly, especially this six. That seems really unlikely that an organism is doubling that many times in a day. So that's definitely an example of spatial variability um, um, being seen in this time series. But regardless, um, it still is important to think about um, the heterogeneity 
of the bloom, whether or not it's uh, temporal or spatial. It, it's important to think about how we're sampling these blooms. All right, so that's the first part of the talk. Um, uh, now I'm going to zoom in on the OTUs that we used in that part of the talk and also supplement it with a couple of other marker genes um, to look at the microdiversity. So we had this question, and I think a lot of people have this question, what taxonomic resolution is best for ecological interactions? There's some evidence that very specific, uh, that interactions are very specific between phytoplankton and bacteria. There was this a paper, Amin et al. in 2015 that showed when Pseudonychia multi-series was grown with a very particular bacteria, its growth increased. When it was grown with closely related bacteria to that one, it did not increase its growth rate. And likewise, when that bacterium was grown with other strains of that species of Pseudonychia, they did not increase their growth. So it was, uh, the, the, phyto, the Pseudonychia did not increase their growth. So that's an example of a very specific phytoplankton bacteria interaction. Um, and then of course, um, the, there are single vi virus and bacterial interactions can be very specific where single mutations can give resistance to viruses. And genomic islands seem to be key to resistance or perceptibility, susceptibility, perceptibility. anyways. Um, so here I uh, used a figure from Breitbart et al, 2008, to, and sort of modify it to say, okay, what if um, under, you have bacterial species that are quite stable, but underneath that you have strains that are responding to different viruses over time. So what ecological, inter so we think that the more resolving you can use, the better. Having said that, you could be potentially too resolving. Um, if you just split up all the organisms, you'll lose power, and to discern connections to one another and to environmental parameters. And you may be splitting on variation that is not that informative. So um, we had a pretty simple question. How much ecologically meaningful variation is obscured by OTUs? We're sort of um, using some, so it's been shown that there is important sub OTU lev uh, level microdiversity in OTUs, Aaron et al., a couple of papers, Tikhanov et al., Callahan, each of these papers developed a new way to look at these small changes within OTUs and showed examples of how it um, exists, but we wanted to know how much of it exists and does it seem to be important. So like I said before, we did 16S for bacteria, archaea, and phytoplankton in this study. Then we also did use the G23 marker gene for the T4, which is major capsid protein gene of T4-like myoviruses. The T4-like myoviruses are approximately 20% of the viruses in the ocean, perhaps, and um, they're known to infect a wide variety of bacteria, including SAR-11, cyanobacteria, some gamma proteobacteria, and there's one report possibly that they may infect archaea. And then we also were particularly interested in SAR-11. It's a very diverse group. And so we developed um, primers for the intergenic spacer between the 16S and 23S for SAR-11 to look at the microdiversity of SAR-11. So how do we do this? So here's that um, we used minimum entropy decomposition on which splits OTUs based on variable positions in an alignment which are higher than the background sequencing error. So here's our mock, and we used our mock community to assess our approach. Um, so here's the mock community that I showed you before. And then here are six OTUs that we saw that were in the mock community and in the samples that we analyzed. And on the x-axis is um, the base pair position of all the sequences in this OTU. And on the y-axis is the Shannon entropy, which is basically um, a metric of how variable that position is in the alignment. And the cutoff of Shannon entropy that I used to um, discern these different um, variants, which we call amplicon sequence variants, or ASVs, was 0.25. And we used the mock community to make sure that we weren't going to be oversplitting these OTUs. So you can see in each case here, these OTUs in the mock community were far below the threshold of 0.25. 
when you look at these same OTUs from the environment, you see that some positions in these alignments are do have high entropy. In the SAR-11, for example, here, this one position had high entropy. So this O2 would be split. If this was 50, if this position here was 50-50, A versus G, then the Gs would go into one ASV and all the As would go into another amplicon sequence variant. Here's the OS-155, you see it did not have any um, significant variation that we would have called. Prochlorococcus, the group 2 archaea, and these other bacteria had um, quite a bit. So we wanted to try to look at what is predicting which taxa have microdiversity and which ones don't. Um, and so here I've shown um, the microdiversity within each um, group of bacteria. So overall, 52 of the 78 bacteria and archaea that we looked at were decomposed into ASVs. And then you can see it by lineage, no zero out of two actinobacteria, 20 out of 30 bacteroidetes um, down to these other groups. And you can see that on average, there are about two to three ASVs per OTU. Likewise, 50% of the phytoplankton OTUs that we looked at were able to be decomposed into different ASVs. You see that it varied by lineage and they were a little bit less, maybe one to two on average ASVs per OTU. So it varies by lineages and within a lineage. So then I looked at maybe how ephemeral an organism is could determine whether or not it has microdiversity. So, so here I plotted the fraction of dates that an OTU was observed. So these organisms, these taxa here, each one of these circles is an OTU. These were occurred on one fifth or 0.2 of the days. And on the Y axis is the subsampled number of ASVs per OTU. So each OTU was sampled to approximately a thousand reads um, per OTU. And then we looked at the amount of microdiversity within those thousand reads. And what we saw was that um, OTUs that were ephemeral had little microdiversity, but common taxa over here could be high or low. Um, and so it would seem, it suggests that organisms that bloom really fast um, or and only occur in a few days are more likely to be have low microdiversity whereas the ones that are common could have high or low. In the inset here, you can see the amount of uh, microdiversity, uh, it should be ASVs per OTU, um, relative abundance on the x-axis. So you can see that it was less related to abundance. And this, this trend held up regardless of the number of sequences that we subsampled to. We also did 2,500 sequences per OTU and 5,000 sequences per OTU. And in the chloroplast, it, this observation tended, uh, showed as, was consistent as well, where the organisms that were common could have high or low uh, microdiversity, and low microdiversity is associated with, associated with ephemeral OTUs. And again, there was no relationship that we could observe with the abundance of the OTUs. So, and then we um, wanted to look at how um, are these ASVs ecologically differentiated um, or are they neutral? Are they suggesting that there's really no ecological difference in the ASVs? So uh, what we found were about 39% of the OTUs had ecologically significant variation. And basically we used to use a Mann-Kindle test which is, doesn't, doesn't ASV go up or down over time? It was a very um, basic measure. Um, you can look at the uh, paper for more details. But here's part of one of the main figures that we showed. Here's on uh, time on the x-axis. And it's a quite complicated figure, but it shows you a lot. Um, the black line is the relative abundance of the catastrophic OTU that we're looking at over time. So you see it goes up to almost... 8%, looking at the secondary axis here for the lines. And on the y, on the primary y-axis is the proportion that an ASV made up of an OTU. So on this first day, the OTU is made up of, a pro of five different ASVs, 
one that was about 45% of the OTU, and another that was about 40%, and then a couple that were smaller. And then the colored lines are basically the black line multiplied by the bar. So you can see the relative abundance and the change of these ASVs over time. And what you'll notice with this catastrophe is that when it tended to be when it was abundant, it tended to be made up of one type of ASV. So it peaked here three times, and the the red type, if you will, made up almost 100% of each one of these blooms. Here's a couple of more um, uh, phytoplankton. You'll see that this phaocystis peaked up to about three and a half percent in March, and about two and a half percent in June and or September. And, uh, uh, July, you see that each time it peaked, it was actually a different ASV in this case. On the other hand, this OTU, Thalassia syra, which bloomed early, which is a, it's a diatom, it bloomed up to about 4% during the early part of the study. It was made up of three or four types that were quite, that made it up. So this was not sort of a clonal, if you will, uh, type of bloom of this Thalassia syra. But in general, for the phytoplankton, peaks have uh, tended to be dominated by single ASVs. So we did the same thing with the bacteria. And you can see here um, that um, the SAR-92, which responded strongly in the, in the bacterial, in the 0.2 size fraction, was made up about 30% uh, or 40%, 50% of the OT was made up by is one type here, um, but in the uh, one micron size fraction, it was actual variability. The red type was dominant here, then the blue type, and then the red type again. And then later, you can see this fuchsia purple came up um, later in July, June and July. The group two archaea also have microdiversity, and you see that um, this one uh, peak was mostly dominated by a single type. But for the most part, the marine group 2 archaea was pretty similar, and the ASVs are pretty similar in their abundance or the proportion of the overall OTU. Later, we've seen that different ASVs can dominate during different phytoplankton blooms, but that's not quite ready to show you. All right, and so for the viruses, first of all, you can see that the viruses, we can't classify them. We just give them lame names like A and C, um, because they don't have any hits in the database. Um, we just know that they're major caps protein genes of T4 myoviruses. But you see that um, they were quite dynamic, similarly to the particle-attached and large bacteria. Um, so we think perhaps these organisms are, um, or these, these viruses are responding more to these types of organisms. Um, then say the ones that are living in the point two, like so in the free living, like SAR-11. Um, and then here's the heat map of the viruses that we saw um, with the phylogenetic tree on the left here. And you can see the relatively long branches. So they're, they're really discrete populations of viruses that we saw, um, but they, they can have very uh, different ecological dynamics. And then when you look at the ASVs associated with these OTUs, you can see that in general, there are fewer ASVs associated with these viruses. And we don't know if that's because it's a um, protein coding gene that some of this variation is removed or whatnot, but there was definitely less ASV variation within these 99% OTUs um, of viruses than there was of, um, in the bacteria and phytoplankton. All right, so for the SAR-11, um, I'm not a big uh, uh, diversity index person, but here I want to just show that there is a, a lot more diversity uh, with the SAR-11 ITS sequencing versus 16, so maybe 10 times more diversity. So tons of diversity in the SAR-11 ITS, and, and this is not all that surprising from a study early in the 2000s where... Jed's lab did about 110 clones of 
um, the 16S, the, the 23S, so basically sequencing through the ITS region of SAR-11. They did 100, and 100 or so clones, and not a single clone was exactly the same. So it's not unprecedented, but it just goes to show how diverse this group is, especially at this gene. So the dynamics of SAR-11 via the ITS sequencing, you can see here it was dominated by one type for most of the time series, especially early on. And when you look at a couple of OTUs, first of all, they all had ASVs, and they often had five or six or up to 12 amplicon sequence variants within each SAR-11 ITS OTU. So an enormous amount of microdiversity in the SAR-11s. Um, take, for example, this OTU here that only peaked um, in June and August. That peak can be explained by a single ASV for the most part, which increased to almost 100% of that OTU's abundance, um, whereas these other ASVs within this OTU decreased over this time. So we wanted to know, and we did a couple of things in the paper, and I'll, and I'll show you one of them here. Um, and so was where the correlations improved um, between viruses and SAR-11 when we used um, the ASVs versus the OTUs. So here's a co-occurrence network of SAR-11 ITS and G23 ASVs where each of the blue symbols here represents a um, SAR-11 OTU and the lines um, represent um, correlations between the two, um, um, between in this case, so, and the viruses are gray V's shape. Um, the edges connect correlated taxa. All these correlations are greater than 0.7 Spearman correlation, which are highly significant point, the less than 0.001 p-value. The thickness of the line shows the strength of the correlation. Um, you see a lot more correlations between bacteria, or these SAR-11s and viruses, when you use ASVs versus the same cutoff for OTUs. Now, it was important to consider, are these OTUs just being split up? One OTU becomes 10 OT taxa, and so you, that's why you get more correlations. If that's the case, um, it would, would the, would the, the correlations may not be strengthened, but what we actually show more in the paper is not only do we get more correlations, but the correlations are actually stronger when we used ASVs. Um, so, we say that the apparent SAR-11 to virus associations were improved by highly resolving methods, and it's probably better to be too resolving in group later, later if necessary. All right, and so that pretty much is going to do it. Um, the summary and conclusions that were that um, mac the microbial communities are generally stable, but these environmental perturbations can lead to dramatic change. Um, Daily, we saw daily scale successional like patterns um, following a bloom from protist to virus, from protist to viruses. We saw varying amounts of microdiversity within lineages and sequence clusters, most of which seems ecologically meaningful. And further inspection of microdiversity and genomic capabilities of strains are likely to reveal further and and then see, we'll be able to see important ecological insights and mechanistic controls of taxa using these um, genomic tools. So what's next? So we're, we've done some metagenomes from, these, um, from this time series, and we're starting to look at the strain variation using metagenomics. Um, so here's um, one of the SAR-92 um, um, organisms that I showed you. And so when we look at um, the, we basically have assembled all the reads, pulled out the SAR-92 and looked at how the different SAR-92 bins recruit over time. And you can see that there are five different SAR-92 bins here. And you can see that it was dominated early by this red and purple. Um, then it was dominated a few days later by this green and blue. And then the blue comes up here again at the end. And this somewhat, um, is similar to the 16S data that we um, see. Unfortunately, we often don't get the 16S in these bins, so it's hard to connect exactly, but I think we're getting, um, seeing some similar dynamics. And then um, I've started to look at how these um, SAR-92 bins are different 
from each other. And so here's a pan genome output from Anvio. You can see um, basically each one of these um, circles is a different bin of SAR-92. And um, the columns here represent contigs, whether or not they're present, or the genes, excuse me, and whether or not, excuse me, their genes, and whether or not those genes are present in each bin. So you see that there seems to be a core genome of SAR-92 here, um, but then each one has this unique um, island or number of genes between that's differentiating the different SAR-92s from one another. So it'll be really interesting to see what it is and what makes these organisms different. All right, and with that, I would like to thank um, my old uh, PhD and postdoc advisor, Jed Furman, who is always enthusiastic and energetic and helpful, um, and the many people in the Furman lab over the years, the Karen lab who we worked closely with, and then USC Wrigley Institute and the people listed here with, that uh, really allowed this sampling to occur, and then also people, other people that helped with sampling. And thank you for tuning in. And um, now I would love to take any questions that you may have. Great. Uh, thank you very much, David, for uh, for an interesting presentation. It's really interesting to see all that all that uh, resolution, both both temporally and then also at the at the sub OTU level. That's really cool. Um, are there any questions? I didn't get anything on Twitter yet, but are there any questions from anyone who's in the seminar that would like to unmute and just ask ask away? Hey, David, it's Maya. Um, I was one that was fantastic. Thank you. I was wondering if like certain OTUs or certain tax to seem like they have more microdiversity within them than others, and I guess I'm thinking about it from the perspective of like if. I'm seeing microdiversity as a way of avoiding phage predation or as one way of doing that. And so I'm wondering if we could use the amount of microdiversity within a taxa to somehow assess like the viral pressure on that taxa. Yeah, um, so that's definitely something that we've thought about. Um, for example, um, like I said, the, the SAR-11s, yes, very microdiverse. Another, so perhaps they are um, experiencing lots of viral pressure. Um, other groups that didn't have so much are example would be actinobacteria. Um, it's really interesting. These organisms grow really slowly, and they're always present, and they have very little microdiversity. And so, do they have a different defense than the SAR-11s? It's possible. Um, and um, I think um, the Thingstad et al. paper, PNAS recently. Um, he's starting to think about that, what makes these organisms competitive and very microdiverse. Um, but in general, it's hard to know, predict if an or a, a group is going to have large or small microdiversity. Um, take, for example, the cyanobacteria. We know they're microdiverse. There was a, a, a paper from the Chisholm lab that showed when you did when they sequence hundreds of single cells, there were there was tons of microdiversity there. But when you compare that with SAR-11, I feel like it's 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 not that it's not that diverse. Which doesn't say that Prochlorococcus is not microdiverse, but the SAR-11s I think are even more so. Um, um, oh, but and when we looked at um, this data, the cyanobacteria. I think two of three or three of four cyanobacteria had microdiversity, so it's hard to say about um, at, at the lineage let predict if a group is going to have microdiversity, but you certainly, I think, can think about modes of defense based on some of these results. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a, I have a question from Twitter now from uh, Luis Bolaños. Um, Asking how do you uh, how to reconcile microdiversity with ecotypes? Is there uh, do you see any connections there that are natural? Um, yeah, I think um, it will be hard because people have studied um, cyanobacteria ecotypes um, very intensely, 
And so they are able to connect um, the cyanobacteria ecotypes to known, you know, temperatures and or nutrient regimes in the ocean. And I, I think that, yes, they're, they're very similar. Um, I haven't looked directly to make those comparisons, whether or not um, the cyanobacteria ecotypes can be seen um, or differentiated with the 6S. However, um, one of Jed's postdocs, Nathan Algren, is looking at that exact question. Um, basically, he did some ITS sequencing of cyanobacteria. I hope I'm not. Uh, anyways, I think he's presented it some places. But, um, uh, and, uh, and so he's starting to look at, can, are we looking at ecotypes and stuff with these, um, with the cyanobacteria ITS sequences? Um, so that, there's more to come on that, but I think maybe it will help. And I, I think, I think it'll be, um, we need more data to really say whether or not these different ASVs are ecotypes or not. Two ASVs that perform uh, or have similar Okay, it's two ASVs that have similar dynamics over this spring bloom, and the other part of the ocean. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. something yeah. something kind of funky is going on. Hold on a second. All right. Who's the end? Can you boot them off? Yep, just Thanks. did it. Right. Somebody was hacking the controller. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. So yeah, I, I think. Ecotypes are a good way of thinking about it, but I think that we would have to do a lot more work to say that these ASVs represent ecotypes. Yeah, I, I, I kind of have a follow-up to that, which is that have you, I, I saw that you did it with some, you know, SAR, um, SAR 11, well, sorry, SAR 92 ecotypes, or at least SAR 92 um, genomes. But I was wondering if you'd done any work with looking at the genomes sort of more um, of like pure culture genomes or anything along those lines that um, relate sort of these the microdiversity back to actual isolates that people have, you know, like uh, you know, because there are some SAR ninety two isolates, some some SAR eleven isolates, Prochlorococcus isolates. Um, can you see anything like that where where the microdiversity matches perfectly with any of the known isolates? Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think that I have, um, definitely not with SAR-92. As you know, um, often they don't, I don't know, I just sort of assume that the sequences that I have may not, I think there's probably a low probability that it'll chance, uh, match something exactly, but, um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I've done. A, I haven't done much of connecting it back to the genomes, and I'm not sure how well it would work because of just the the low number of cultures that we have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there any other further questions, either from inside the hangout or on Twitter? All right. Well, David, if people want to get in touch with you later to ask you a question, um, what's the best way? Um. Well, they could. I uh, well, they could send me an email at d m n e e d h a at gmail dot com, or they can get in touch with me on Twitter, um, and then I can give you that email address again. Um, yeah, we've got you on Twitter. If if you uh, if you want to get in touch with David on Twitter, you can look at the hashtag microseminar, and we've put his handle in a bunch of tweets there, so you're solid there. Animalcules. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Uh, really appreciated it. And um, we'll look forward to, to more from you in the future. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Okay.